Okay, so um, we'll just talk about a trip that I did that was called a Parish in the Heart of Normandy, cruising Spain. And I did that back in uh, February, so, sorry, in uh, May of last year. Uh, I'd ask everybody to please mute your microphone so we don't have uh, any extraneous noise. Uh, Richard is going to help me do that. So I went with a Viking rad rig, and I've done a number of uh, river trips with Viking. And as I said, it's May the 17th to 24th of last, of last year. And the trip started off in Paris, went down the Seine until we reached Rouen, and then by bus to the beaches of Normandy, and then back. I arrived the day before in Paris, which I, I prefer to do that, so I have a relax and not worry about missing the, the ship itself. And I purposely stayed uh, in the Latin Quarter of uh, Paris, in this hotel right here. You can see where it's related to the Seine River. It's on the left bank of the river, close to Cathedral Notre Dame. And as the hotel is, it says uh, Park St. Severin Parish. It's next to a church called St. Severin Church. And that allowed us, uh, Edie and I, to walk around that afternoon and the next morning also. Next to our hotel was this church. And in the morning, I went into the church and I was quite pleased and surprised to have this lady sitting at the front playing a cello by herself with almost no one in the church, just playing. And um, then she left. And the church was totally empty, just the two of us sitting in this wonderful church. So it was quite a pleasant experience. And then just across the street, a couple of minutes away from the church, there is this church, uh, which is the oldest church in Paris, called saint julien le pauvre now a Greek Catholic church. And it also has in its uh, yard the oldest church in Paris. And next to it is a square, which is uh, the square of St. Julien le Pauvre, and it has this uh, fountain. And you can see its relationship to Notre Dame Cathedral, which is just behind it across the river itself. And you can actually see on the right some of the scaffolding in Notre Dame. So in the evening, uh, on arrival, we did walk across to Notre Dame, and you can see uh, the scaffolding still on it. And then the next morning, we walked again, and from the front, you wouldn't know that there was anything that had happened there, but obviously it had this big fire that is still under construction. It's always wonderful to just walk around the streets in Paris with no destination in mind, past the cafes, beautiful uh, flowers in the windows, very nice place to walk. And then I walked a little further away from the river, here on the left-hand side, you see part of the Sorbonne University, it's the Université de Paris. And it was one of the oldest universities in the world originally, it just had its charter in 1200. And, but this charter was suspended, the university was closed after the French Revolution from 1793 to 1806. So it didn't run as a continuous university from 1200. Close by is the Pantheon, which is the mausoleum. But it's interesting, it has Foucault's pendulum in it that was created in 1851. And about a five minute walk from the Pantheon, you come to the Luxembourg Gardens and the Palais de Luxembourg, started by Marie de Medici in 1615. There are uh, these beautiful gardens with linden trees. And unlike many of the places that we get to visit here, the signs say, please walk on the grass, the opposite. And people do enjoy themselves on the grassy areas in between these paths. There is a fountain called the Fonte Medici. And uh, here it is uh, with very nice reflections in the water around the fountain, in front of the fountain. So uh, around noon, we headed off to the ship. It's the Viking Radgrig and just uh, some thing about Radgrig. Radgrig is one of the legendary horse riding Valkyries, handmaidens of Odin, the father of the gods. And these long haired, beautiful women would descend from the skies into battle to decide which soldiers lived and which died. 
So that's the name of the ship. It has 168 guests, or can house 168 guests. And it was built recently in 2020. In fact, 2022, the spring was the first year that the, the ship uh, started to have tours along the Seine. It was custom built for the Seine River. So we're on one of the earliest tours with this new ship. The uh, ship and its sister ship here were docked at the Port de Canal, which is just a, a bit down river from the Eiffel Tower. And it's an up and coming, very uh, ghost uh, place to be nowadays. There were issues related to COVID at that time, as, some, as you would know. France itself required nothing. You could just come to France without any COVID testing, but Viking itself, the company, had a protocol. And it required that we have a negative PCR test done within 24 hours of leaving Vancouver to come to Paris. And when you arrived, you got rapid tests done on board. And two couples tested positive and they were removed from the, the cruise and taken to a hotel by Viking and looked after by Viking, but didn't go back onto the ship. And then we got daily saliva PCR tests for the next three days. And if they were positive, and again, another couple were positive on day three and they had to be taken off the ship also. So it was quite a significant problem if you were tested positive. So here's our ship, and you can see its relationship to the Eiffel Tower. On the left, the island in the uh, Seine called the Ile de Seine or the Island of Swans. It's a man-made island. The first bridge that we see is just for trains. And the bridge afterwards, which I will show you shortly, can walk along the water to that second bridge, uh, is a double-decker bridge with a train on top and pedestrians and cars and bikes uh, underneath. So from the ship at night, you can see the Eiffel Tower, it rotates uh, a bit, the uh, light rotates around the top. And every evening they have this light show, at the, just I'm on the deck, the top deck of our ship watching this. And as I said, I walked to the second bridge uh, and um, the bridge is called Bir Hakim. And Bir Hakim was the site of a very important victory for the French troops uh, that happened uh, between the 27th of May and August 11th, uh, on June the uh, 11th, 1942. Now, many of you will know that the Germans occupied France quite rapidly during the war. The French had called back Marshal Pétain, who had been a hero in the First World War to lead the troops. And he had uh, basically made an agreement with the Germans to, uh, and asked the French soldiers to put down their arms. And I think a lot of people were not too happy with uh, what was seen as not particularly courageous French soldiers. So when they won this battle, it was a uh, battle of the first uh, brigade of French free forces repelled the assaults uh, of two divisions of the enemies and affirmed to the world that France had never stopped fright fighting. So they put this monument there and named the bridge Bir Hakim. The bridge is actually quite pretty to look at when we're walking on the bottom floor. I I show you this in black and white because I think it's a bit more impressive than in color. And as you walk off the bridge on the left bank of the river, you come to a small park uh, which has this monument which was inaugurated in 1994. And it, I translated it here for you. The French Republic pays homage to the victims of racist and anti-Semitic persecutions right. and crimes against humanity committed under the de facto authority called the government of the French state, 1940 to 1944. Let us never forget. Yeah. And the war finished in 1945. This was inaugurated in 1994, 50 years later. And Jacques Chirac was the first president of France to finally apologize for the atrocities that occurred under the French. And he did that in 1995. So 
I had read earlier before I went, having nothing to do with the fact that I was going to go to France, this novel, and it's in English, it's called Sarah's Key, but originally it was uh, written in French, uh, called El, El Sapele Sarah. And um, this novel was based on a true story of the round up of Jewish, mainly Jewish children and women, but some men, uh, by the French uh, forces, by the French police in 1942. Uh, sorry, and, uh, and these uh, people were taken to a velodrome de Vey called Veldiv, and it's called a round up of Veldiv round up on the 16th and 17th of July, 1942. And it turns out that this Valdiv was just across the area from where I was just showing you that monument uh, that uh, they had just inaugurated in 1994. So it says 13, this is not my photograph because I didn't actually visit this plaque, which is where the Valdiv used to be. It's now office buildings. But 13,000 Jews were arrested in Paris, deported and assassinated at Auschwitz. In the Velodrome of Ive, uh, there were 4,000 children, almost 3,000 women, and very few men. The men had been rounded up before. And they were there under very bad conditions, and they eventually all got sent to Auschwitz also. But right next to this area is the memorial garden for the enfant, for the infants of Valdiv at uh, Rue Nelaton, if anyone is interested. And it has the names of all of the children who were in this velodrome. And here it says a list of children arrested by the French police and put in the velodrome de Vey before being deported to Germany. And there is a bit of an outdoor museum with some little stories of some of the kids. It's quite a moving uh, thing. And I was quite pleased to visit this just because I read this book, which is based on this true story. These children and women were then sent from Valdiv to internment camps in Petivier and Bon de la, bon la Golande, close to Orléans. And I took this picture because after our cruise, and I'm not going to talk to you any more about it, we went down to Orléans. I went on a visit along the Loire Valley and visited this museum, which was again a museum uh, for the children of Veldi. So now we were in Paris for two nights on the ship, and then the ship started to sail downriver. And as we left uh, our berth, you can see uh, that we're leaving the end of this Swan Island, and there is a Statue of Liberty there. It looks like the Statue of Liberty, and it actually is a replica of the Statue of Liberty. And it was given to the French people by the Americans in 1889, which is the centennial of the French Revolution. It's a quarter size replica of the statue in New York. The statue in New York had been given to the US people by the French and was dedicated in 1886. So it's an interesting story. Our first stop was in Vernon. And in Vernon, like every other town that we visited, there would be a big church or a cathedral. And you could almost be sure that the big church or the cathedral would be called Notre Dame. And so this was, it's a collegiate church of Notre Dame de Vernon, built between the 11th and the 16th century. And one of the features uh, that we saw throughout our trip in Normandy were these half timbered houses. We can see the wood with along the outside of the house. And here on the left, another half timbered house. And uh, one of the nice things about uh, cruising on the river is that you can get off your ship. I, I got off the ship before breakfast and I went for a little morning stroll into the town. Met this uh, lady walking her dog. It's pleasant. And uh, Vernon is one of the eight sites in France for the Ariane group, which is the group that sends the rockets to space, the space program, those who might be interested. In the morning, we were taken by bus to visit La Roche Guillon. And La Roche Guillon, here you see on the left, is painted by Claude Monet. We hear a lot about Claude Monet in this trip. 
one of the side streets with beautiful geraniums hanging from the pots on the side of the building. And I was interested to pass the Children's Hospital, Hôpital d'Enfant de la roche Here it is. Um, fairly small, but a children's hospital nonetheless. But the main uh, importance of uh, La Roche-Guillon for the tourism is Chateau, yeah. Yeah. Chateau de La Roche-Guillon, which was built in the 12th century. And this chateau was the headquarters for the German Field Marshal Rommel. And after D-Day, he defended Normandy against the Allies from a bunker in this castle. You can visit the bunker, which is in the lower part of this big building, not at the top part, which was part of the old castle uh, built in the 12th century. I visited and we visited inside the castle and they had an art display. And then there were different rooms of art and other things displayed. And one that's quite interesting was a room that just had four Louis XV Gobelin tapestries uh, done in 1769. And they represented the story of Esther uh, the huge, the 11 by 13 feet in size. And here are two of them, one King Ahasuerus and the coronation of Esther on the left, and the other one, the condemnation of Haman. And we have Purim, the festival of Purim that uh, commemorates the events of Esther coming up fairly soon. So here on the left, we can see the view of the ship of uh, the collegiate church. And you can see that Claude Monet painted the same church except for a little down, straight, down river, slightly different angle. And so we're going to go and visit in the afternoon uh, Giverny, where Claude Monet has lived. And as you cross the bridge, first of all, we passed uh, a branch of the uh, Seine River, a remnant of a, an old bridge, and you can see a mill house uh, with a half-timbered structure here. It's a mill house that also was the subject of some impressionistic paintings, such as this one here. So we visited Giverny, I visited the gardens and the house, I went inside on a tour inside. And the, uh, we have microphones that uh, we can listen to our guide explain things from a, quite a distance. No guides are allowed inside the house, but she talked us through the tour from outside and we could uh, listen to her uh, description and tell us which direction to go in next and she would tell us what was going on. One of the, Wonderful things uh, of uh, getting a guide with these kinds of voice boxes, as they call them. The gardens themselves, they're quite pretty. They're not exotic. They have very simple kind of flowers. You have a lot of peonies and poppies and these crimson pot rock roses. But they're clumped together in large groups, and so they look very uh, pretty. Even foxgloves, which are like weeds here. The main... Uh, beautiful part of the thing is the water garden, which is where, of course, uh, Monet painted a lot of his uh, water lily paintings that are very popular. And this is one view of the water garden, which we visited after the crowds had uh, stopped and we came back after and just, we had enough free time that we could do that and just be there by ourselves with no one at this time. In this, um, Feeling somewhat impressionistic myself, I created this photograph with a little bit impressionistic look to it of the same water garden. And we had these damsel flies that were flying around over a little stream just uh, to one side of the water garden. And uh, I spent some time trying to capture these uh, damsel flies. One of the famous uh, features of the water garden is this Japanese style bridge. Um, lots of wisteria in bloom at the time we were there, as you can see, beautiful reflections in the water. And here is my picture on the left. Here is Monet's painting of the same thing on the right. You can see that not everything was exactly the same in when Monet was painting, but it's the same from the same place. You can see the willow tree in the background on the left, same thing. Well, Monet painted these particular huge canvases in his atelier, his workshop on the site at Giverny, which we were able to visit. And these paintings are at the Musée de la Rangerie in Paris, which we visited when we got back to Paris. But I put it here so you can see a uh, juxtaposition with Giverny. 
And you can see the size of these paintings relative to my wife, Edie, and my sister-in-law. And um, here's another painting. It almost looks like these two uh, ladies are part of the painting, but they're not. They were just there in uh, the museum. Um, sorry. Enjoying themselves in front of Monet's painting. And a final impressionistic view of another part of the water gardens with a house in the background. This is before all the people had left. So being in the spirit of impressionism, I uh, uh, took these pictures of reflections in the scene as we were traveling en route to Rouen, our next stop. And I spent a lot of time just contemplating the water and the ripples in the water and reflections cause different colors to the ripples. So it's quite interesting. You can just dream a little bit. We reached Rouen, very famous cathedral, Rouen Cathedral. And I show you these two pictures. They're almost, uh, they have the same subject matter, slightly different angle, but pretty close. But the light is different. And you'll notice a dull on the left, light on the right. And it looks different depending on the lighting. And Monet knew that. And Monet painted over 30 paintings of that cathedral in different lights. And here are just three examples of Monet's paintings. The one on the left was actually in the museum in Rouen and the Musée de Beaux-Arts. And here again, even in the bright light on the left, early in the day, on the right, almost at sunset. Totally different light. Lots of half-timbered houses in all part of Rouen. This one from 1736. Here are some others. Other churches. This one is the Church of saint Maclou, And I show you this one in particular because just in the churchyard itself, here there's a Etre of saint Maclou. It's a mass burial site for death that occurred during the Great Plague of 1348. And so it has all these kind of crossbone symbols and things of that nature, the bones on the top, the wood, because there are lots of bones in this uh, particular churchyard. There are some in the museum, but most of them are under the ground. Lots of cobblestone, different patterns, different colors. Pretty to look at also if you want to take some time to look at the ground. And opposite the um, east wing of this uh, cathedral, there's a street that goes straight to the old market square called the Rue de Gros or Long, it's the, Rue, the, the street of the great clock. And it has this 14th century and an astronomical clock sitting on the street, which is where it got its name from. Um, here you can see the clock in closer up. Uh, if you go under the arch, you go toward the Old Market Square, but there are lots of side streets that come off the main street. And uh, here's one that I quite like, the uh, decorations with the colored umbrellas. And so we reached the Old Market Square, the Place de Vieux Marché. And uh, this is a very interesting uh, square historically, because this is where Joan of Arc was burned at the stake on May the 30th, 1431. And on this square, and I'll uh, use the cursor, on the left-hand side, we'll have a look at this building here shortly. And the right side, they had an old church, they built a new church, and so around the corner, you get to the location where Joan of Arc actually was burnt. Here's the new church, quite modern. And on the left-hand side of the square that I've shown you, there is this La Couronne. The oldest auberge or oldest inn in France from 1345. And it's a beautiful building, as you can see. It no longer has rooms to let, but you can go to the restaurant. And that's where Julia Child had her first meal in France. And on her menu, uh, she had her meal was Sol Minier. And according to Julia Child, this meal changed her whole life and made her wish to learn French cooking and the rest is history, as it were. So uh, we went afterwards to visit the Musée des Beaux-Arts and uh, opposite the museum itself, there was this park and it had this wonderful water feature with the uh, water flowing over little waterfalls. 
And inside, as you would expect, we had paintings to do with Joan of Arc. Early, early Joan of Arc, the vision at Dom Remy, she was uh, born in the northwest part of uh, France in the Alsace-Lorraine region in a little town called Dom Remy. It was a village, had sheep, as you can see in the picture, and she had her vision that she was destined to lead the French king to victory over the English, which she finally did at Orléans. And um, then later on, she was captured by the English and she was denounced by the church as a heretic and finally burned at the stake. And so the painting at the right is her being denounced as a heretic. And finally, one last picture of the, the uh, cathedral in two different lights, both clear blue sky, one earlier in the day, one late in the evening. And because we had a long day that was May, we were able to have dinner on the ship and then walk off the ship into Rouen, walk to the cathedral, just walk around until the sun went down. So it was quite pleasant to do that. So we now take you from Rouen. We went to visit the Normandy beaches. It was a day tour, a full day tour. There were two uh, tours. One that was to the American beaches, the Omaha beach particularly, and one that was what they called the Commonwealth tour, which went to Juno Beach. We went on the Juno Beach tour. Most of the people on the ship were American. And so they had four buses going to the American tour and one bus that was only half full going to the Commonwealth tour. So we were quite lucky that way. So we didn't have too many people to contend with. Also, we got to visit a place called Bayou en route to the beaches. And you can see Bayou here that we visited Bayou. Then we went to visit Juneau Beach. Then we went to the uh, cemetery for the Canadians. And then we went to visit this Pegasus Bridge, which you see the British flag next to, and you'll hear a bit about that. And uh, Bayou itself is a very small town. It has a little uh, canal going through it. It has a mill house, it's water wheel little boats in the canal. And of course it has its church and the church is the church of Notre Dame, um, the Bayou. I quite was intrigued with this little pump. It's a hand uh, water pump that you used to get water out of a well. I don't know if it's still working, but it looks like it might be. And I, was greeted by this cat, didn't look at me at all, but looking at somebody else, I guess, or some, but posed for her photographs. But the main feature in Bayeux is the tapestry called the Bayeux Tapestry. Um, and this tapestry is an embroidered cloth, nearly 70 meters long and 50 centimeters tall. And it depicts the event leading up to the Norman conquest of England in 1066 that was led by William, Duke of Normandy, challenging Harold II, King of England, and culminating in the Battle of Hastings, which I, I learned about at my school in Barbados. Maybe some of you have learned about this also in your schooling. In any case, there are 70 scenes in this tapestry that relate the whole story going up there, and they're all in one room, which you can visit. They're originally behind glass, as you can see here, these are not my pictures, uh, the one on the right is uh, from the internet. So I'll tell you the story about William the Conqueror. William the Conqueror, the only son of Robert, Duke of Normandy, but he was the son of Robert's mistress, so he was illegitimate. So he became Duke of Normandy at a young age, age eight, when Robert died in 1036, and he was known as he went on as William the Bastard, not William the Conqueror. The King of France supported him, and he and the King, uh, he mainly with his uh, forces fought successfully to secure his hold on Normandy and the neighboring provinces by 1064. So by then he was already about 28 years old. Edward the Confessor, who was the King of England, had no children, and he was a great uncle of William and named William as his successor. Edward died in 1066. 
And Harold Godwin, William's brother-in-law, who was the most powerful of the English lords, claimed the throne, even though Harold had actually come to Normandy to meet with William to tell him that Edward had indicated that William would be the king after he died. And he had sworn allegiance to William, but he assumed the kingship. Of course, William got told about this eventually, and he invaded England. He met and defeated Harold's army at Hastings, October the 14th, 1066. Harold and his two brothers were killed in the battle. William was crowned king of England on Christmas Day in 1066. So this tapestry, was, uh, and thereafter he became William the Conqueror. This tapestry was there to teach people about what happened because most people didn't read. So here you have some writing, but mainly pictures that show here, for example, here in number 23, this is uh, Harold, Harold in Normandy swearing allegiance on the Bible to William with his sword. Here are the Normans going in their boat to England. Here's the Battle of Hastings, arrows flying, spears, and finally an arrow into Harold's eye, here blown up. Those are the sorts of pictures that the tapestry depicts. So after visiting the tapestries, we went for lunch and we were taken for lunch at Lyon d'Or. And in the bar at this, uh, it's a hotel and it has a restaurant, it has this bar. Many, many famous people have been here. Steven Spielberg, Tom Hanks, Prince Charles, now King Charles, Jack Chirac, Ernest Hemingway, Eisenhower, and you can see all the pictures of some of these people on the wall of this bar. So from here, we went to visit the beaches, the Juno Beach. And in the picture on the right, I put there separately because it shows two places called Benouville and Ronville, which we visited this area after we visited the beach and the cemetery. This is where they have the Pegasus Museum and Pegasus Bridge was at uh, Ronville. So here is the Juno Beach Center, which is a Canadian manned uh, museum uh, dedicated to uh, the Canadian landing with videos and all kinds of artifacts. And it's interesting that uh, there's a permanent staff, but there are also rotating staff of young people that they get from all across Canada who vie for these positions. They have to be able to speak English and French fluently. And there are five of these young people there. Here is the actual beach where the Canadian, 3rd Canadian Division landed on June the 6th, 1944, suffering 340 dead and 574 wounded during this landing. And of course, there are lots of the accoutrements of war that you will see on the site, in addition to going inside the museum to see the artifacts there. And then a visit to the cemetery itself. Uh, it's on the hill above the water. It's Beni sur Mer, and 98% of the people buried here are Canadian. And there's a cenotaph, and our guide, as you can see her there, Viking Radcrig 4D, she brought a, a wreath to lay on the cenotaph. And we were the only Canadians in the group, so she asked if we would uh, put the wreath on the cenotaph, which we agreed to do. She read a poem, she said a prayer, and then we laid the wreath. And then we went on to visit the Memorial Pegasus, which I hadn't known anything about. And this uh, was a glider mission of the British 6th Airborne Division, that's why we have this English, British flag on the map, led by Major John Howard. And just after midnight on D-Day, before the forces came ashore by boat, um, they landed by gliders to secure the Pegasus, also Benouville Bridge over the Can Canal and the adjacent Orsa, Orsa or Ranville Bridge over the Orne River. And one glider landed just 43 meters from the Pegasus Bridge. It had flown across the channel and landed within 43 meters from the bridge they wanted to capture. So this surprised the Germans. There was no, just one or two people manning the bridge and it, took over the two bridges very rapidly. 
This is the original bridge that was uh, taken over, which was replaced by a new bridge in 1994. So they have this original Royalville Bridge sitting on the site of this uh, museum now. They have uh, replicas of the gliders. You can go inside and see what it was like for the soldiers who were in these gliders. And there is a movie made about this, uh, the D-Day, the uh, including this glider mission called The Longest Day. And it turns out that one of the men in the first reinforcement was the Lieutenant Richard Todd, who was an actor. And he actually played the role of Major John Howard in this film. So a bit of trivia for you. So we went back to Rouen, boarded our ship in the evening, and we were en route again back to Paris. Stopping first at Les Andelys. Les Andelys, a very small town. Um, you can see the limestone uh, cliffs in the background. Has an interesting monument, an interesting person, I guess. Um, has this monument to Jean-Pierre Blanchard, first person to fly across the English Channel in a balloon. And he went from Dover to Calais in 1785. He went with another person together uh, uh, with Jeffries. And as they were crossing the English Channel, the balloon started to come down, they, they put their ballast overboard, so it went up again. A little further on, the balloon started to come down, they threw the food overboard. Finally, they got across the channel, but the balloon was coming down too quickly into some trees. So they took all their clothes off except for their underwear and threw that overboard. And they finally landed uh, safely and had only their underwear on. So they were heroes. But the main feature of this town is this castle. Castle on the hill is Chateau Gaillard, built by Richard the Lionheart, who was the Duke of Normandy in the latter half of the 12th century. And we can walk up uh, to the castle here. I have beautiful views. You can see on the right-hand picture, our ship docked, the town of Les de Leaf, the limestone cliffs, which you see better on the left-hand picture. And limestone in Normandy is always the same. It has flint in it. So it has this black, dark flint going through the veins of the white limestone. And a lot of the buildings are built with this limestone. You can tell it's Normandy limestone by the flint that's in it. And when I got back down to the bottom, we got back, we had these beautiful cloud formations. I just had to take a photograph to see the clouds. That's fantastic. So our next step was to go to Le Pec, which is almost at Paris, just 15 kilometers from Paris. And the reason for stopping there uh, was to visit uh, a house, which I'll show you shortly, but en route, we uh, passed these fishermen. Different style of fishing, holding their rods. I've not seen anything like this in our rivers, but maybe others have. And then a lot of the trees as we passed throughout our trip in uh, France this time, and these little blobs of green blobs are on the trees. And it turns out that this is parasitic mistletoe. It kills the trees eventually. And it's very common there. There's a couple of pictures of us on our ship. Uh, getting ready to have a meal on the left. High tea one day, they had high tea. They had special type of coffee if you wanted it. We didn't realize it was laced with alcohol. So we declined it when it came and just asked them if we could just have some tea to go with what looked like very nice high tea accompaniments. So we visited Le Pec to visit this house, which is uh, Chateau du Malmaison. Uh, where Napoleon I, Napoleon Bonaparte and Josephine live. And Josephine bought this house when Napoleon was at war in Egypt without telling him anything about it. He came back from the war and it was a fait accompli. But he lived there with Napoleon, uh, with uh, Josephine. On the top, you can see his study where he worked and planned. On the bottom, it's uh, Josephine's bedroom. And in the theme of Napoleon, we reach Paris and we visit La Place Vendôme. In La Place Vendôme, we have the Vendôme column, which has Napoleon Bonaparte on the top of it. Napoleon wanted this built modeled on Trajan's column in Rome to celebrate one of his major victories. 
It was built originally, uh, finished in 1810, but then later on, Napoleon was removed. Then even later on, the whole column was broken down. And finally, it was rebuilt and remains now. This is from 1874. Well, to finish off, uh, we had a Jewish tour of Paris, which I'd arranged months in advance. Um, but it brings us back to the event that I mentioned originally from July of 1942, because when we visit the Jewish district in the Marais district, this is the district where Sarah, the heroine of the uh, uh, book, uh, lived. She lived in uh, the Marais district at 36 Rue de Saint-Ange, and there are buildings there that have these signs, like here live Baruch and Dora Matkansky, and their daughter Esther, nine years old, deported in 1942 by the Nazis with the active complicity of the Vichy government, and exterminated in Auschwitz because they were Jews, to their memory. And in this Jewish district, uh, the district is uh, in this area here, the, where the Pletzel is, all of this area is the Marais district, which is the Jewish district, or used to be the main Jewish district in recent years. It used to be a swamp at one time. And you can see the sign that says Pletzel, and this is the area of Pletzel, it's a little square of historic interest. And it has uh, just opposite where this picture was taken, this very nice looking uh, bookstore. It's a bookstore of the temple, Shir Hadash. And if you are interested in falafel, people line up to go and get falafel at this one place called Last Du Falafel. And there are other falafel places nearby that you can get your falafel immediately, but people will line up there because it's very famous. We were taken on tour by this young lady on the left. Her name is uh, Flora Goldenberg, and she took us into one of the museums. She lives in this area. In one of the uh, synagogues, as you say, they're very small synagogues and almost like houses. Here is one of them. But interestingly, uh, this young lady is the granddaughter of Joe Goldenberg, and she, Joe Goldenberg, was a restaurant which was attacked in 1982 by the Palestinian militant Abu Nidal organization. It no longer exists, but she's the granddaughter of this person. And there's a Goldenberg, which is now just a, a, a shop for women's wear close by. And sorry, I'll show you the map first, because we're going to visit finally this area right uh, here, which is on the edge of Ile de la Cité, just as you get to Ile Saint Louis, and there is a very interesting uh, memorial in this area. And it's the memorial to the martyrs of the deportation. Um, see if I can move that out. And on the outside, you see looking out into the Seine River, and on the inside, or opposite this uh, thing on the left hand side, there's this room, and you can look inside. And on the top it says, to the memory of the 200,000 French sleeping in the night, exterminated in the Nazi camps. No mention of uh, uh, Jews in this, uh, just French people. And when you look inside, uh, there's a grave, which is the tomb of the unknown deportee. There are 200,000 crystals, 100,000 on each side, reflecting light into the room. And there's a light at the end, which is the, memori uh, the uh, memorial light that signifies hope and life. So with that, I will thank you for joining Edie and me on this, what turned out to be a very pleasant and wonderful trip down the Seine and up the Seine again. I'm going to try to uh, stop sharing, screen sharing. Stop sharing, and let's see if we can get gallery view here, gallery view. Okay, so I'm happy to take any questions or comments at this time. You'll have to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question.
Okay. Paul, that was an amazing trip and amazing photography. Thanks for that. You're welcome. Thanks. Finished faster than I thought it would finish. Okay, I, I had a question, Paul. Yes, Carolyn. Um, it's Carolyn. Yes. Um, okay, you had this lovely a, a trip, obviously, and I must say with um, with Dawn that uh, the photographs are superb. Um, but I, you obviously covered very little distance. And in retrospect, um, if you were to what? go over this territory again, would you choose to do it the same way? Would, would you recommend it as opposed to just having it like a rental car and, and stopping? Was it fun just to do it that way? No, I'm sure, Caroline, that either way would work quite well. Um, the nice thing about being on a cruise like this is that you put your stuff in in your room, all your clothes. You you don't touch. You don't do anything after that. You're looked after. You're pampered. You get your breakfast. You get your meals. All the tours are included. None of these tours will cost anything extra over and above the cruise. You get expert uh, guides who give you a lot of information that you wouldn't otherwise know anything about, and. On the ship itself, uh, they brought uh, someone to talk us about the history of Impressionism. And she was so wonderful talking about uh, Monet and his love life and all kinds of stuff that you wouldn't uh, get to hear much about. But it made it that much more interesting. Um, I, I went for the next part of my trip, which I did not wish to speak to you about today because it would be too long. We went on a tour with a car along the Loire River in the Loire Valley to visit different chateaus from Orléans to Tours. And I didn't want to do it with a rental car myself. So I had someone drive us, there were four of us, someone drove us, and we hired guides in each of the places to take us on a professional tour of the different places rather than just doing it all on our own. Of course, we had lots of free time to just walk around and explore on our own in addition, because I don't like to rush my travel. I like to uh, cover small distances, not be in a car for a long time, and just walk around the areas and take my time and enjoy. That's how I like to travel. Well, can I just follow up on that comment? Uh, my experience on, on river tours is that sometimes the off the ship uh, parts are very long walks, often with a guide. And for the walking challenged can be uh, a lot of work. I mean, and you, I know you walk a lot, so this would not have been a problem for you, but could you comment on how, how much walking was involved at the various stops? And, and uh, yeah. So none of them had a lot of walking. And uh, they would warn you if the tour had a part that was a bit more uh, difficult than just an ordinary flat walk. And so, for example, Edie, my wife, um, she has some difficulty, particularly going up hills, gets short of breath, got an unlined up problem. She was able to go up the hill up to Chateau Gaillard. She just had to stop and go up. But the nice thing about these tours that uh, certainly Viking does, and I suspect many of the other uh, river companies do, they give you at the beginning of your trip a box, a voice box, with an ear thing that sits in your ear, and you put this uh, in your pocket, charge it every day. But this voice box works that you don't have to be with the guide. The guide could be meters away from you, you can walk around, I can walk around taking my photographs. As I said, we walked around inside Monet's house where guides are not allowed. And the guide was outside in the garden and we could hear her talking. She said, okay, now go left. You'll be in this room, you'll see this and I'll tell you about it. Okay, now I want you to go through and turn to the right and I'll talk about that room. And so it is. So these give you a lot of freedom even during the tour to walk around on your own and not be right behind a guide. Sometimes if there's a Thank you. 
difficult. They have options. And right. They might even bus you yeah. if you say, you know, it's too difficult for me to walk. Right. So, so uh, all of the cruises we've done with Viking, they've always had options for people who were mobility impaired so that they would make arrangements for them. So for example, we went in Portugal on a Viking trip and we were going to a church, uh, which is high up on a hill with many, many steps that the uh, uh, pilgrims would go up on their knees. But if you didn't want to do that, they had a bus that would take you to the top and you could go and see the church. And if you wanted to walk down, which was easier than walking up, you could do that. So they always had these options and they, they had, when they had multiple different uh, op, op, uh, tours, they would tell you how strenuous it would be. So you knew in advance. Their definition is strenuous and mine are not quite the same because what they call strenuous, I would say was moderate, but still it gives you some guide to what you should and shouldn't go on depending on your mobility ability. Oh, thank you. Uh, lovely photos and very informative. Do the, these tours run all year round and did you have to book a long time in advance? Uh, yeah. The, the tours, depending on where you're going, the tours will run uh, when the water is expected to be acceptable for river travel. Some of them are all the time. So for example, in Europe, they'll often have Christmas tours. For those people who are interested in seeing the Christmas markets, for example, they have one of those along the Rhine River. Um, uh, but we have always traveled in May or October. Um, trying to avoid the summer months uh, when the weather should still be good, but it's not hot, hot, hot. You have to book a lot in advance to get the tour that you really would like to go on. So we book usually about a year and a half to two years in advance if we think we want to do it. Okay, thank you very much. So Paul, that raises an interesting question. We were with some other people in France and it on September, on October 1st, many of the things that we wanted to visit were closed. And uh, that end of September seemed to mark the end of, of, the, um, of the tourist season and many of the smaller museums and so on just closed up. Have you encountered that at all traveling in October? So far we have not, um, no. And you're still comfortable with Viking. They've had a few, ship events over the years um they yeah. have you, you're a viking recommender you know what uh, you Paul? we we have had good luck with viking it was the first um river cruise ship that we use we we enjoyed it we went again we enjoyed it and we keep have kept going and we've enjoyed them all i am sure the other cruise lines are also good I'm not trying to tell you that Viking is the best or the only one to go on. It's the only one I have been on and it's the only one I can talk firsthand about. I think they do a good job. And I think they're a good company. I was very impressed on this particular trip <laughs> that the staff were so complimentary about the Viking company itself. The, the Viking paid all of their staff fully during the pandemic, even though they weren't going anywhere. They kept all the staff and they paid them all. And Torsten Hagen, who is the CEO, the owner, I think he lost about $20 billion during that time. Okay. Mm -hmm. But he paid his staff and the staff are loyal, were loyal, they were just glowing about how they had been treated. And so you come on the ship and there are almost nobody who's moping. They're all upbeat happy to be doing what they're doing. And it felt good that we were supporting a company, as it were, who had uh, taken that kind of uh, approach to, to keeping their staff in difficult times. I don't know what the other companies did. They may have done the same. I don't know. So be careful in how you interpret what I say. I have a bias. Ben. Uh, hello, Paul. Thank you very much for that wonderful talk. Jenny and I were both enjoying your photos and your 
your lively commentary. We too have taken three Viking um, trips and also eager to speak up in favor of their running the company in an admirable way and making a good experience that's designed for people even with mobility issues. Uh, so the river cruises are particularly nice because the boats are smaller and so it's a more comfortable. The larger ships you know, get larger, but they're still small compared to the huge cruise liners. But beware, it is expensive. And so that's be prepared to pay for that. And yes, book a year or two years in advance. And we had we had good experiences. While I have the microphone, I guess I just should say that I'll be speaking to this group next month. Um, and so I hope uh, some of you will tune in and uh, listen to the story that I'll tell about the history of my legendary uncle, the photographer David Seymour, uh, and his time. So I uh, look forward to uh, seeing and seeing some of you during that next talk. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. So one of the things that, for those who have not been on River Tours, you've seen here, whichever you go with, is that you're docked almost always close to the center of a town. And you get off the ship and you can do it whenever you feel like, basically. So I, I could go on this, off the ship first thing in the morning, go for a quick walk, get back and have breakfast, and then go on the tour, have lunch. Afternoon is free, I can walk into the town again, go and have a nap, get up, have dinner. After dinner, go for another walk and so on. It, it makes it so wonderful to, to have a holiday like that, that's without worrying too much about things. Hi, uh, Paul. Um, this is Cynthia. I'm sorry, I uh, I didn't follow very closely, but I thought I heard you say that um, you were interested to visit something uh, uh, particular uh, with some Jewish history. And uh, did you did you say that you asked to have it included so that you could go visit? Uh, oh. No, so on this trip, it turned out that the, the ship happened to be docked in the area where as soon as I walked out and started walking around the area, I said, oh, I, I see the monument to uh, Valdiv. I didn't realize I was going to be close to that. And so I said, okay, that's where I am. So I will look around some more in that area. But I'm Jewish and uh, my brother and his wife were joining us on the, after the cruise and I said, why don't we see if we can do it, a Jewish tour of Paris, which I've never done before. I've been mm -hmm. to the areas, I've done it on my own, I've not had a guide. I said, let's get a guide. And so I went on the internet and I found this lady, Flora Goldenberg, who it turned oh. out was this uh, granddaughter of this uh, person whose restaurant was bombed. And oh. uh, I, uh, we, we arranged for a tour with her. Oh, I see. Sure. Okay. Not so this is not part Viking. of the Viking. No. It was not, it's before. Okay. I spent a day before on my own, just walking around. And mm -hmm. then when we got back to Paris, uh, we had the evening before we went to the Loire Valley and we just walked around, but we had one tour that we arranged for two hours with a Jewish, uh, Jewish uh, Paris. This is, this is very good. Yes. Thank you. Okay. But uh, be, before we leave, I'm just going to give you an update about what's going to happen in the next uh, couple of talks. <coughs> Our next uh, speaker is going to be Niam Kelly. And quite appropriately, she's going to give us a talk on March the 16th about Ireland. Just the day before St. Patrick's Day. So get you into the spirit telling you all about what you need to know about Ireland. And then on April the 20th, we're going to have a talk uh, um, on <coughs> Puglia and Malta. Um, I can't remember who is giving that talk. Oh, it was by Peter Dodek. Peter Dodek, who has not talked to us before. So we're going to have two new speakers. Uh, we're going to have uh, Niam and then Peter who will talk to us. And so we're looking for any um, volunteers to give a travel talk 
in May, and I think we have someone who's volunteered already for June. And then we're into the summer recess. So we have one more slot available that I'd love to have somebody else to have volunteer for. Okay, so you can let me know. Are there any other questions before we uh, <coughs> close the meeting? Comments, questions? Jennifer, did you have your hand up or were you just... Just, you're, you're muted. You need to unmute yourself, Jennifer. Okay. Good. I've never been on a river cruise. I would love to. Do you have any tips as to sort of which cabin to choose and uh, which level of the ship would be? That's a good question. So I've always... I'd love to hear. <laughs> yeah. I've always traveled on what they call uh, French balcony balconies, uh, which are okay. um, ceiling to floor windows that slide, but you don't actually have yes. a balcony that you can yes. walk out on. And on all the Viking cruises up to this one, the French balcony rooms were pretty well identical to the one with <coughs> Miranda, cost a lot less, but they were the same size, same amenities. You just didn't have the ability to okay. sit inside. Uh, but on this particular... Okay. The case, other... And I saw that the, back, the veranda rooms were bigger inside even than the room that I was in. So were I traveling on this ship again or a ship similar, I might choose a veranda room that so I had a little extra room inside. For me... Outside is not as critical. I can do that on the deck or anywhere. But for some people, they love to be able to sit outside in their private little area, and that's just fine. And book a veranda room. Okay. I've already checked the note the ship. Thank you on my computer while we're talking. Now, what level of uh, would you ideally think is is good? The cheapest one. The middle deck or the top? It doesn't Sorry? matter. You're not on the ocean. You're okay. not with a rock. You're, you're not worried about turbulence. Yeah. <laughs> and as far as I'm concerned, I usually, when I book well in advance and they're available, I get the cheapest veranda, cheapest uh, French balcony room that's available. I don't really care where okay. they put me on the ship. Okay. <laughs> Thank <laughs> that's, you. That's my feeling. I don't know. Other people who travel on Viking, <clears throat> uh, Ben, uh, did you have any thoughts about? Which rooms you should stay in, or you like to stay in? We like the little balconies that you could go sit outside on. Right. Um, Does the level matter to you? We went from Nice to in, uh, North um, uh, in, the, in the southern part of France on that river cruise. We actually did a river cruise, but it's a larger ship that went up the St. Lawrence. Uh, from Montreal to out to Boston and New York, so that's a little that's a larger ship. And but the Viking people run a very good, um, you know, it's a family-owned business and has a long history, and they really try to do a very nice job. We liked also the the each evening there was a port talk where they would give a talk about the the next city that you stayed in. So they were really catering to the diverse. Um, needs that people had. Some really wanted a lot of history and stories. Others were just sort of relaxing and taking it easy. The food is quite nice. You have an option of cafeteria or a little nicer restaurant, and it's all included, which is another nice, nice pleasure. So we're, we're going on another Viking cruise in May. We'll be going down the Rhone River from Lyon down to Avignon. That's and we did that the other way. Right. And uh, then we're going to go afterwards by road to spend a week in Nice after that. Mm. Sorry? Some, oh, Don, of, sorry, Lorna. Lorna, <coughs> you. you're muted, Lorna. I did, I did. Okay. <laughs> Uh, regarding where to be on the ship, somebody had, or on the mm -hmm. boat, somebody had told us, oh, you're always on the deck and you're always outside, so you might as well sleep in the bowels and mm -hmm. save the money. 
So we had a tiny little port ho- porthole that wouldn't open. It was cute to watch mm-hmm. the ducks floating by <laughs> beside us. I don't, we were about 18 inches above the water, but because things would not open, there was no fresh air. And one of the, uh, the uh, people on the boat got sick. And the next thing you know, I got sick and it was 10 weeks of barking. A heavy, heavy cold. What ship was this on, uh, Lorna? That was a Viking cruise. That was, a, yeah. From uh, from uh, Nuremberg to Budapest. Really? Okay. Yeah. We, we've been on that cruise. But as I say, we've always got uh, uh, the slight in French balcony window. So well, we, we, we booked late, so we were... Stuck below decks. Right. And I would never, ever, ever do that again. It was That's just a, a breeding ground for germs. <laughs> okay. So in general, uh, in the COVID or post-COVID kind of uh, caution or precaution, uh, are you, what do you do with that? Well, Flying and <laughs> traveling. I don't think there are going to be any precautions now, but I don't know that. But we were traveling still when Viking had a, a protocol. We had to wear masks on the ship. Uh, mm-hmm. we, were we had to wear masks on all of the tours, even if we were outside. So you saw the pictures of us laying the wreath at the Cenotaph. We had masks on because that was required mm-hmm. by Viking's policy. Not mm-hmm. by the French government, but by Viking's policy. So we adhere yeah. to the policy. Mm-hmm. I don't think they're going to have any precautions like that unless something happens with COVID between now and May when we travel. Because I think people are everywhere just going back to normal is how they behave, even though COVID is still around, I agree. But that's how it is. Thank you. We may mm-hmm. wear a mask, but that's our preference. Mm-hmm. We, they may not demand it of us, and we can't. We can't ask people to put on a mask, please, because by can said, which we did during this trip. Every now and then, there'd be a couple of people who did not want to wear their mask, and we would say, "Would you mind? We would prefer that you wear a mask." They would. And if it's in two years' time, we just need to be prepared. Who knows? When I booked it two years before, I was sure that uh, the oh, pandemic sorry. would be over. Uh, but it wasn't over. And we had to deal with whatever the rules were. That's what we dealt with. So I don't know what it's going to be in the future. And we went and didn't get sick. So. We didn't get sick. So we were <laughs> The other thing for those who have not traveled on river cruise before, and the same thing may apply to other types of cruise lines, <coughs> If, if, if you are going to go on a Viking cruise, and this is your first Viking cruise, you can get a $100 US per person discount if you get a referral from someone who has already been on a Viking cruise, has a Viking number, as it were. So you can just ask some, a friend or someone that you know, if you would refer, you need to get their number, give it to Viking, you get a discount, and the person who refers gets the same hundred dollar discount on their next cruise. Mm-hmm. So it's a kind of a small amount, win-win kind of situation. But yeah, it costs nothing to do that. So find somebody who's going on the cruise line that uh, who's been on the cruise line you're interested in doing, and see if you can get a referral from them, so-called referral. <laughs> uh, save yourself a couple hundred dollars per cabin, typically. There's some other things that you should be aware of that some people were not aware of, and I don't know. Viking will um, book your air travel for you. Sometimes the air travel is uh, discounted as part of the the ticket that they're selling at that time. They'll say free free air or $999 uh, for your air travel to wherever to meet the ship. They will book it. And do not let, you can let Viking book, but don't necessarily uh, accept the itinerary that they want to put you on. For a small fee, like about $50 or something like that, 
You can get a variant. And you can choose the flights you want to go on, have Viking book them, and pay that amount. Similarly, the special fares that they give are always an economy. If you say, I would prefer to travel economy plus or premium economy, or I prefer to travel in business class, ask your travel agent because Viking will book the business class seats for you if you wish. Again, you pay a little extra charge and they will book the exact airline that you want, the exact flights that you would like to go on. Now, we met some people who went with Viking. They had to drive for 100 kilometers to the airport that Viking wanted them to leave by from. They didn't need to do that. They could have paid the extra little charge and gone on the flight that went from their own hometown and get in a day before if they wanted to, as we did. So mm -hmm. you, can, you can do that kind of manipulation. And I suspect the same thing applies to other um, companies. I don't know mm -hmm. that for sure, but for sure in Viking, you can do that. So does it mean that you can make such requests through the travel agent? Yes. Or you have to... No. The travel agent who's booking your your tour, or if you go online yourself and book directly with Viking, which I usually don't do. I, I use a travel agent, but if you use a travel agent all the time, the travel agent will probably give you a little extra discount over and above the list prices of Viking. But uh, you ask him, uh, said, you know, I like to travel with Air Canada. Okay, some people like to travel with a different airline, American or whatever. So I want to go with Air Canada because I have status with Air Canada. Well, I want to go on my flight from Vancouver nonstop to Frankfurt. Viking, if you left it to them, might say, well, it's cheaper for us to put in Vancouver, Toronto, Toronto, Frankfurt, or whatever. I want to go the day before. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I usually go online. I said, even the flights that I want, send it to Viking, see if they can do that for me. And Yes, they can do it for you. And I then find out what will Viking charge. And I look at what I can get myself. If I can get it cheaper, I book it myself. If Viking gets it cheaper, I would let them book it for me. Mm -hmm. The only positive about having Viking book it, in addition to what I just said, is that they're then responsible if you get there late. They're responsible mm -hmm. for finding another flight for yes. you. They're responsible. They meet you at the uh, airport and take you to the ship. So a few extra things you get thrown in for Viking booking. Yeah. And different people <clears throat> will find those perks uh, very valuable. And other people say, that doesn't mean much to me. I can take a cab from the airport to the ship. Not a big problem. So. Well, just a, a couple of points to add to that. We, we traveled uh, a couple of years ago with UniWorld. And it was exactly the same deal. And it, it really did pay to have them do the airline booking because they met us in the airports and arranged visas and things like that. The other comment I thought I would make is some years ago in the early days of the travel group, we spent some time discussing the merits of using travel agents or not. And a couple of people recounted experiences where a good travel agent had really, really been helpful to them while they were traveling. And Helen and I, who had always done our own bookings, we switched and we now use a travel agent and we have had that experience. We were stranded in Argentina and our travel agent really came through for us. So uh, I think although it's easy to do the whole thing online, including booking a cruise, there's definitely something to be said for, for finding and using a good travel agent. And by the way, thanks for another wonderful talk, Paul. That was just brilliant. Thanks, Richard. I enjoyed yes, thank you so much. For you. Are there it's, any it's travel awesome. agents anybody would recommend? I beg your pardon? Are there any travel agents anybody would recommend? Well, I'm happy to share my travel agent with you. Um, do I think uh, he's the greatest travel agent in the world? I don't know because I don't have other travel agents that I deal with, so I can't tell you. Would somebody else do better? Maybe yes, maybe no. But he's, he, he's, I met him first in Vancouver, but now he lives in Toronto. But with the internet, it doesn't really matter where he lives. And he's part of a company that's from the United States now, but to me, it doesn't matter. 
And frankly, uh, even if I use a travel agent, I go online and see what uh, deals I can get. And I let him know, I saw this deal online. And he'll almost invariably say, I'll match it and I'll do better. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. uh, and I've even got, a, I've met a travel agent who took a group of people on one of my Viking cruises. I got her card from her and I contacted her about a cruise that I was interested in doing. Her price was no better than what I was being offered by the travel agent. But if it had been, my travel agent for sure was going to match it. They're all looking for business and uh, they, they get a commission and they're, they're going to want to book you if they can. So just let me know, MB. I'm happy to share my travel agent with you. I'm pretty sure they will take extra business. There are some travel agents that are already too busy. They won't accept new clients. Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, again, thanks everybody. Thanks so many people. Oh, I see a hand up here. Is that still here? Okay. Good. Thank you guys. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. You're very welcome. Bye bye. Thank you. You're welcome.